Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug. Welcome to my channel. And in this chemistry video, we're learning about how to write formulas for ionic compounds. So if you're new to my channel, if you've never been here before, hope you subscribe so you don't miss a thing so that you can get the best score on your chemistry assignments that is possible. So as we start here, let's just remember what ionic compounds are. When we say ionic compounds, we're talking about substances that are composed of ions. And when we say ions, we're specifically talking about cations and anions. So just in case you don't know or have forgotten, cations have a positive charge and anions have a negative charge. And the way this works is opposite charges attract. So if we have a positive charge and a negative charge, they're going to be attracted to each other. These negatively and positively charged particles have what's called an electrostatic attraction. And so since these opposite charges attract, we can have a, a fairly important force here. And so these uh, compounds, these ionic compounds, are actually able to stick together and, and have a fairly strong bond. Now, most of your chemistry classes, if you're in my class or someone else's chemistry class, you're probably going to have access to an, uh, an ion chart, something that looks like this here. This is the one that I use in my classes, uh, a chart of the most common ions and their formulas in a first year chemistry class. If you'd like a copy of this ion chart, I'm going to put a link to it in uh, the description of this video so you can download this and use this chart to follow along with this video or any other uh, example problems in your chemistry class. Now, as we look at the ion chart here, you might notice that there are some vocabulary words like monatomic, we see here about the middle of the, uh, of the page. And then over on the right side of the page, we see the word polyatomic. So maybe it makes us uh, wonder what is the difference between monatomic ions and polyatomic ions? Well, the answer is kind of hidden in the word right, right there because the word monatomic, it sounds like mono. So those have one atom in them. So for example, if we're talking about the ion chloride, that has one atom in it, one chlorine atom. So we say that the chloride ion is a monatomic ion. On the other hand, polyatomic ions have multiple atoms in them. So just as an example, if we think of, oh, let's say the sulfate ion that was on the, char on the chart there, it has a formula of SO4 and it has a, a negative two charge associated with it. Well, it has five atoms total, one sulfur and four oxygen atoms. So that's five atoms. Anything that has two or more atoms in it and is a charged particle, is a polyatomic ion. So we're going to be using this chart as we go through the process of naming, I should say writing formulas for ionic compounds. Now there are some ions that are very common and these are just 12 of some of the most common polyatomic ions. I would strongly recommend that you learn these. Just learn them by heart, memorize them. I know some people don't like that word, but you really need to learn these ions. And there are some others. As you progress in your chemistry uh, knowledge, you will need to learn even more of these polyatomic ions. And so those are fairly important in your study of chemistry. Well, as we talk about the actual process for writing these formulas, I have seven steps. And this will get you through almost any ionic compound. There are a few that this won't work for, but for most of these that you're going to have in a first year chemistry class, this is certainly going to work. So notice the steps. I know this looks like a lot, but the fact is, as we work our way through several examples, by the time you get to the end of this video, you should be able to go through these steps without even really thinking about them. So for example, the first step says to note the name of the cation, that's the, the positively charged ion, and write its formula and then make a note of its charge. Uh, the, the third step is to note the name of the anion and write its formula. So the anion is the, the one that's got the negative charge. Make, make a note of its charge. And the fifth step says look at the absolute values of the charges. If they're equal, you are finished. So what that means is if you have a plus two 
and a minus 2. That's a case where the absolute values of the charges are equal. Or if you prefer, you know, plus 1 and a negative 1. That's another case where they're equal. But if the charges are not equal, you will need to swap the charges on the ions using the charges or the absolute values of the charges as subscripts. So we'll see some examples of that here in a minute. And then the last step is if you're ever placing a subscript onto a polyatomic ion, place parentheses around the polyatomic ion. So we'll see examples of all of these as we work our way through the examples today. So here's the first example that we're going to look at, calcium sulfide. So the first step is write the symbol of the cation. So that's always the first part of this. So cations are always written first. So calcium is Ca. And the second step is what is its charge? Well, you can look at your periodic table or an ion chart if you have one and notice that calcium has a positive 2 charge. So we have that. And then we have sulfide. So sulfide has the symbol S. That's derived from the sulfur atom, sulfide. And its charge, if you look at your periodic table, you'll see that it's a negative 2. So we have those. Now step 5 says if the absolute values of the charges are equal, you are finished. Well, if you look here, we have a a positive 2 and a negative 2. So those, those cancel out, don't they? The absolute values of the charges are equal. So when you write the formula, you just scoot those symbols together, and that's the formula, CAS, for calcium sulfide. And that's all you've got to do. Now let's try another one. Let's try sodium oxide. We're going to go through the same steps here. Sodium has the symbol N. A. So we write that down. And what's the charge associated with that? Well, if you look at your ion chart or a periodic table, it's got a charge of positive 1. How about oxide? Well, oxide is derived from the oxygen atom. It's got the symbol O, and its charge is negative 2. So do these charges cancel out? Are the, the absolute values of the charges equal? Well, they're not. Plus 1 and a minus 2 don't cancel out. So the rule is, step 6 says, if not, we have to swap them. So what that means is when we scoot these atoms together, or these symbols together, the 2 right here is going to become the subscript on the sodium. And then the 1 becomes a subscript on the oxygen. Now, we don't write 1s though, do we? So we're just going to leave that part blank. So when you swap them, it looks like this. So it's Na2O. So that's how you write the formula for sodium oxide. Now here's the next one, nickel 2 phosphide. So once again, we have nickel, and that's got the symbol Ni. And then the charge is plus 2. This Roman numeral here actually tells us the charge of that metal. And the reason that that Roman numeral is there and it wasn't on the others is that nickel can have multiple charges. Nickel is sometimes a plus 2, sometimes it's a plus 3. And so we have to have a Roman numeral for that one anyway to tell us which, which charge we have. So that's kind of some, some nice information to have when you're writing the formulas. Now phosphide, well, that comes from the phosphorus atom, so that's P. And Looking at the periodic table or the ion chart, you can see its charge is negative 3. So do the charges cancel out? Are the absolute values of the charges equal? No, they're not. So we have to swap these charges. When you scoot these together, the 2 will go down here on the phosphorus, and the 3 will go down here on the nickel. So it's going to look like this. And there's your formula. Ni3P2. Let's try another one. Let's try cesium hydroxide. So cesium has the symbol Cs, and its charge is positive 1. Now hydroxide is a polyatomic ion, so we're not going to find that one on the periodic table. We'll find it on the ion chart that I showed you. And hydroxide is OH with the charge of negative 1. So once again, I'll ask you the question, do the charges cancel out, 
or do we have to swap them? Well, they cancel out, don't they? Plus one and a minus one. So when we scoot these together, that's it. It's just CSOH. Let's try another one. Let's try tin two nitrate. Now tin has the symbol SN, and do you know what its charge is? Well, yeah, this Roman numeral two here tells us its charge is positive two. And then nitrate, that's a polyatomic ion. It's got the formula NO3, and its charge is negative one. And so do the charges cancel out, or do we have to swap them? No, they don't cancel out, so we have to swap them, don't we? So when we scoot these ions together, the two is gonna go down here as this subscript right here. But you may notice that this looks kind of funny. It, it, Looks like a 32 almost, doesn't it? This is where the seventh step comes in. So if you'll remember what that says, it says if you're placing a subscript onto a polyatomic ion, put parentheses around the polyatomic ion, kind of like this. Now, do you see why that's practical? Now, the main reason that we do that is to show that this two right here applies to that entire polyatomic ion, not just to the O, but also to the nitrogen as well. So that's why the parentheses are there. Now that also gives us an added benefit that it keeps this from looking like a 32. So that helps us out there as well. So that's the formula for tin to nitrate. Let's try another one. Let's try silver phosphate. So the symbol for silver is AG, and we can look at the ion chart and see that its charge is a positive one. And then phosphate is a polyatomic ion. It's PO4, and its charge is negative three. So do the charges cancel out, or do we have to swap them? We have to swap them, don't we? So when you scoot these together, we swap the charges just like this. And notice that there's no parentheses around the PO4, around the phosphate, because we're not sticking an additional subscript onto that, are we? Let's try another one. Let's try ammonium chromate. So ammonium is a polyatomic ion, has the formula NH4, and it's got a charge of positive one. And chromate is also a polyatomic ion. Its formula is CrO4. It's got a charge of negative two. So do the charges cancel out, or do we have to swap them? Well, you can see we have to swap them, don't we? So when you scoot these formulas together, you put the two down here, and do we need anything else on that? We, we certainly need parentheses, don't we? Because this two, we want to show that that two applies to the entire ammonium ion. So we put the parentheses there. That also keeps that from looking like a 42, doesn't it? So that's kind of practical there as well. Now, as you look at the atoms, we can actually count up and see how many atoms are in this, this formula unit here. You might notice that there are 15 atoms in this total. And if you're wondering, where do we get 15 atoms from? Well, notice that the N, there is one atom of nitrogen in the ammonium, but it's multiplied by two. This, this two out here means it's multiplying everything inside the parentheses by this, this two here in this case. So we have two nitrogen atoms. And do you see how we have eight hydrogen atoms? It was four, but it's four times two. So four hydrogens there. There's only one chromium. And there are four oxygens. So when you add this up, that gets us to our total of 15 atoms in that, uh, in that, oops, I forgot the, Make that an eight, uh, an eight instead of a four. Four times two is eight. So there we get our 15 atoms. So next, we go on to titanium to chloride. So titanium has the symbol Ti. And what is its charge? Well, it's a positive two, isn't it? So we have a plus two there. And then chloride, that's a polyatomic ion. It's ClO2, and its charge is negative one. So as you look at the charges, do they cancel out or do we have to swap them? Well, we have to swap them, don't we? So we scoot these together and we swap the ions like this. And what else do we need? Hopefully you see that we need parentheses, don't we? So parentheses 
around the chloride. So that's the, the formula for this one. We'll do one more to wrap it up for today for this lesson. Dinitrogen trifluoride. Now some students will, will look at this here and they'll say, well, let's see what's the charge of nitrogen and fluoride, and they'll try to look at the charges and swap. But we don't have to do that. Okay. The reason we know that is that there are numerical prefixes here. There's a di and a tri. And if you see those numerical prefixes, that means this is not ionic. So we don't look at the charges. We don't look at the ion chart. We don't you know, try to cancel out and swap. We use the numerical prefixes to name it. So that means dinitrogen means that there are two nitrogens here. And the tri, well tri means three, so trifluoride just means that there are three fluorine atoms. And so that's the formula. So remember that if you ever see a compound that has a name with these numerical prefixes like a di or a tri or a tetra or penta or something like that or a mono in it, we know that it's, it's covalent, it's molecular, and we don't do the charges. No ions, no ion chart there. It's just use the prefixes. Whereas if it doesn't have those numerical prefixes, we have to think about it in terms of ions in the ion chart. I hope you learned something from this video. If you enjoyed it, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, if you're new, please subscribe. My name is Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching chemistry for over two decades, and I hope uh, you are able to learn something from my videos and and uh, enjoy this. If you do, please uh, subscribe. Hope to see you again where we can learn some more chemistry together.